I see Miss Mallow, I see Miss Palmer, and I see Miss Hotop. Excellent. All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 District 4 Candidate Forum Night. I'd like to thank our sponsors first. Let me share a screen with you. Can everybody see my screen if you can just nod, please? Okay, great. All right, so welcome everybody to the Howard County Public Schools Special Education Candidate Forum Night. Um, this uh, particular discussion is with the candidates running in District 4. So I'd like to welcome everybody. I'd first like to thank our sponsors. First, we have CCAC, the Howard County Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, um, who works with the Department of Education to, to advise on all issues relating to special education. I'd also like to thank the Howard County Autism Society, <clears throat> which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is really dedicated to uh, serving individuals on the autism spectrum and their families and to ensure that they thrive in the school system and in the community. We just finished uh, District 1 Forum and now we are here in District 4 Forum. So I'd like to welcome Ms. Palmer, Ms. Mallow, and Dr. Hotop. I am Dr. Heidi Abdelhady. I am your moderator this evening. I am the parent of a child um, on, with autism um, who is a Howard County student and I am also a critical care physician um, on the front lines acutely aware of the devastation of the pandemic, both its infectious and its non-infectious complications. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wanna thank you for your service, for our incumbent um, uh, candidate, and I would like to thank the two others running for um, office uh, for your willingness to serve. Special education goes well beyond the schoolhouse. And the quality of education and the intensity of education that is delivered to our students absolutely changes their course, their life course and their outcomes. And it can make a difference between who can become independent and earn a living wage and who may not. So our work is really rooted in community effort and your role on the Board of Education is more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It is really a life altering role that you have for students with IEPs and 504s. I wanna go through a couple of ground rules. First, for our viewing audience. We do have a chat box that is active. Um, please submit questions that are general in nature, not specific to your student or your family. Also, please keep yourself muted because we do want to be able to hear our candidates clearly. Um, and, and respect the time that we have together. Candidates, each of you will have two minutes to answer questions. At, when 30 seconds is left, I am going to put this um, uh, red paddle up so that you know um, you have 30 seconds to conclude. And when I turn it to black, that is when your time is up. I do have helpers here with me who are watching a clock for me. Um, I will ask questions in an alternating manner. We will not have opening statements, but each of you will have two minutes at the end of our forum to make a closing statement. So with that, I'd like to start with the first question. And this question is to each of the candidates. As we started with the conversation on COVID, um, this has altered all of our lives, especially our students' lives. So the first question is, accessibility of the curriculum during virtual learning is extremely challenging for many in special education, especially those who are younger and those with more significant needs and the needs for supports. They are also the ones at greatest risk for falling further and further behind their peers. What is your plan, your vision, for bringing students back into the classroom? And we'll start with our incumbent, Ms. Mallow. Well, so 
I think it's really critical that we are talking about COVID and its impact on special education. And I thank you for the question. One of the things that has really become clear to me, particularly in the last week, um, when I had a parent call me and their child had just begun to receive um, services at one of our schools providing um, in-person special education, and they were able to talk with me about how it was and wasn't meeting their expectations and how they believed it was and wasn't meeting their child's needs. And so it really was important to me to hear from our parents and hear from our community what is working and what isn't working and how we can really take those lessons learned as, I mean, we just started with small group instruction last week. So we're now entering week two for some students and then for school-based learning centers, we're just entering week one. So we're gonna really need to have that critical feedback loop where we're learning and improvising and revising and providing the supports necessary for our students to have success. So in order to bring them back, they need to be safe, as well as they need to be able to be in a situation where they can productively learn. So um, really, I think when we're talking about accessibility, we need to be looking at tools and what we can do to supplement and support our students with those accessibility, whether it's headphones, whether it's um, other software programs and that kind of thing. Thank you. Ms. Palmer, same question for you. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, so this is something that I think we have lost a lot of time by not having better definitions uh, and metrics for when we are going to bring our children back into the classroom. Um, I've been advocating for a while now that we have a plan, particularly for our most vulnerable students. So our younger students, um, students with special needs. I think that, you know, the idea of bringing them in to classrooms to continue doing virtual education um, or, you know, to, to not have in-person instruction, uh, I don't think is going to help very much. So I would have liked to have seen, and, and if I'm on the board, I will be very focused on defining metrics and decision criteria that identify um, what conditions need to be met in order to return, you know, what number of children back into the classroom. Um, I think safety is of paramount importance. And so we need to ensure we have proper, you know, mask usage and social distancing and cohorts so that we can um, minimize the interactions across different student populations. But I think that, you know, there are a number of studies out there and, um, you know, many experts believe that it is our most vulnerable population that is falling further and further behind. So my focus would be on developing a plan that has, you know, identified criteria and metrics in order to make decisions about how many children, you know, which children we can bring back into the classroom and get ourselves on a path for um, returning to in-person education, again, particularly for our younger students and students with special needs. Thank you. Dr. Hotop, same question for you. We, you're muted. Yep. Got it. Sorry. I thought you guys were not on mute, so I apologize. But anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things, my experiences during COVID um, with this issue has just been how amazing the teachers and the support staff have been uh, in getting my family's accommodations addressed, right? So, um, I have a child with dysgraphia, and it turns out that a lot of the apps that they're using, like Pear Deck and Jamboard and all those types of things, don't work uh, with um, the speech-to-text program um, that we're given to use. Um, and so the school tested and identified that, you know, a couple of different solutions and, and found we couldn't make some of them work because there wasn't the the 
the hardware available that was needed for it. And so ultimately they were able to give him an iPad to be able to do it to supplement his Chromebook. Um, and you know, it took a lot of people to help us with that. And I just really appreciate all the effort that we are getting um, to support. That said, it's not enough. <laughs> we, you know, the students who are going back, it, it, it seems to be that they're going back to um, still have online learning, even those students who really can't access the online curriculum. Uh, and that doesn't seem to make sense. We also have the problem that all the teachers are being used now. So where would you find the teachers to do online learning in the classroom? Are you gonna ask some children to give up their teachers? Um, and I have a friend in Indiana who has experienced that where their school system said, you either go in person or you have to change your teacher. And I think we have some big questions that we're avoiding right now um, and that we need to have addressed sooner and we've waited too long. Thank you. There are also students with disabilities who don't speak English and are really struggling with virtual learning. The superintendent keeps stating that they are working on plans while other systems, our neighbors, are bringing some students back into the buildings where they do have direct instruction led by a certified teacher and aid on a computer. What would you do to ensure these students who are able to comply with masking and distancing protocols to keep safety as paramount? How do we ensure they don't fall behind? At, at this time, uh, let's begin with Ms. Palmer, please. Okay, thank you. And I just want to clarify the question. Did you say the children who cannot comply with masking and social distancing? Who can. Who? Children who can uh, tolerate wearing a mask properly and can talk, mm -hmm. um, you know, being distant at least six feet and being comfortable doing that. Okay, and so, so what, would, what would I focus on doing in order to help bring them back and, and provide them support? In, with direct instruction, not the state that right. we're in currently. Yeah, no, I, 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 I get it. Um, and I would say similar to, to what I said with the first question, I think we should have already been there. I think we should have already had a plan for how we were going to bring those children back. Um, and again, we should have had a plan. I'm not saying they should all be back right now. But we have had seven months now to consider the situation, and we've known for many months that the children, you know, the uh, English language learners, children with um, disabilities, many other circumstances are the ones that are going to continue falling further behind. So, um, so I would focus on having a plan to bring them back. There are many other school systems, as you said, both in our state and across the country that have already done this. And I think it's been, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's the situation that I would want us to be in where we are followers as opposed to leaders. But the fact that we are now um, behind many of those other school systems, I think it's a great opportunity to learn. We can look at what has worked um, in other school systems uh, and learn some lessons there. Obviously, we can look at what hasn't worked. Um, I think the challenge right now, quite frankly, is back in August when other school systems opened up earlier um, and we decided to wait, uh, we lost some time there. And where we are now with fall and winter approaching, which everybody knows that um, it's going to be a challenge in the cooler months when people are indoors. So, you know, I, I feel like we're uh, behind the curve for sure. Um, but I still think what we need is a very clear plan that articulates what we're going to measure and how we're going to make decisions to get those children back in class. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to change topics and, and skip to reading. And we'll begin with Ms. Hotop here. So reading specialists are screening students for reading difficulties once they are in kindergarten as per the Maryland Readiness to Read Act passed in 2017. Best practices suggest, and the, the, the law suggests, that multiple times at multiple grades is best. However, students with reading service hours in their IEPs will not receive those services while reading specialists are screening kindergartners. We are different than other counties in that our reading specialists are doing the screening 
and not our general educators. How would you work to require HCP HCPSS to one, follow best practices, and two, to ensure that children's IEPs within the area of reading uh, remain compliant? So, um, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, I've seen the guidelines on best practices and I've seen what we're doing and it, it just, it does not seem to connect. Um, you know, all kids at that age, um, and I have one right now, I have a kindergartner, um, they develop at different rates. They, de they develop these skills at different times and you need all of those screenings in order to be able to capture that whole picture of each child. Um, because not every child is going to be in the same place. And so I really do feel that it's very important that those screenings happen multiple times a year. And, and kids can suddenly go through leaps and bounds of progress. Um, and that's natural. That's, that's part of child development. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it has to be in the hands of, of the general educators. And, and in the same way that, you know, evaluating for math is in the hands of the general educators. Um, I will say, you know, my student, my son has already um, had some, you know, I'm not sure if it's that assessment for, for reading um, by his kindergarten teacher, but the kindergarten teacher made time to, to do an individual assessment with each child. Um, and I think the teachers are able and willing, um, we might, you know, have to provide substitute teachers to support them or aides or something like that. Um, but I do think that it's important. And I think there's other reasons why it's important too, is the child will feel more comfortable with their kindergarten teacher. Um, at that age, that's really important. So when my son was, my older son was assessed by the reading specialist, he actually had an issue with the way she was holding the book and it took us a long time to figure that out. And so he wasn't being assessed properly. Um, so anyway, I, I, think, I think you're spot on and it's really, we just need to find a way to do it. Thank you. Ms. Mallow, um, same question with a bit of a twist. You are a current sitting board member and we know that um, the process of screening has been well described and our neighboring counties have plenty of teachers who have been trained, hundreds, of teachers, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery County. Yet we here in Howard County use our scarcest resource, which is reading specialists, to do screening that is well within the, 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 the purview and the, the competency of a general educator who's received the training. So as a sitting board member, how would you influence and, 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 and ask that the, the staff adapt to address this quickly? So a couple of things will need to happen. One is we need to be able to utilize the technology that we have and um, use multiple modes of assessing. So there's both formal and informal assessments. So I do believe that every child in the classroom setting should be getting regular and routine assessments of the reading ability. And that can be done with kind of the small group instruction. The teacher can both track in how they're reading in small group instruction at, within like a breakout room, as well as then a formal assessment. So I believe that at this point, the most important thing to do would be to work with through the office, um, the curriculum office, and ask them what's being developed in order to kind of broaden our depth of knowledge and ability skill set for classroom teachers to be able to do this formal assessment. And how are we then, you know, activating and pushing that out? Is it being directed or is it a suggestion? What is being done to support the educator in order to facilitate this happening? Because we do realize that there's a lot going on with educators right now in terms of many of them are still learning the technology, learning how to use tools like Pear Deck and other um, reading supplemental programs. And so we, it really needs to be at the central office level 
to provide supports so that we can effectively deliver these assessments and administrations of them and to do it in a way that's very natural and just kind of part of the everyday experience. Thank you. So Ms. Palmer, along the same subject line, but we will move on to after the screening years and into uh, reading instruction that typically ends in second grade, okay? Specialized reading instruction. So specific reading instruction ends in the second grade, yet almost 50% of all students are not meeting third grade level expectations, meaning students will not be able to assess, access their education in later years, and they continue to fall below expectations. What do you propose and how do you plan to implement strategies to help children after the third grade? Yeah. Um, I, I have to say I was astounded when I saw some of those statistics um, in terms of, uh, you know, reading proficiency and the fact that such a huge fraction of our students at the third and fourth grade level are not proficient in reading. So I think this ties into a little bit of what you were talking about in the previous question um, in terms of the training that we provide to our educators, the way we deal with students in HCPSS. Um, you know, the, the waiting to fail model, I think is, uh, I don't understand that at all. And I think waiting for a child to be sufficiently far behind to provide them with the support that they need um, for proficiency is the exact wrong thing to do. So I think we need to focus on ensuring that, you know, children are proficient in elementary school. We need to ensure that we're providing our um, educators with the proper training. One of the things that I noted, um, and again, you alluded to this, when you look at the fraction of HCPSS um, instructional staff and the fraction that are aides compared with the total number, Howard County is much higher than Montgomery County, Moore County, and Arundel County. And so um, it doesn't seem like we are addressing the issue holistically. So I think we need to you know, develop a strategy, as I think you said. And what I've seen in the current board is that we don't seem to have really a strategic plan around much, um, and certainly not around educational outcomes. So the, the reading proficiency and the math proficiency at the fourth grade level, I think it's completely un unacceptable. We need to understand the root causes of why we are having those challenges and then address them with appropriate training for our educators, <laughs> uh, for training for our educators um, and make sure that we're providing the right support to every child. Thank you. So to, to, to the point you just made regarding our staffing, um, I'd like to share this slide with the three of you and ask for comment. The slide clearly shows that we here in Howard County over the last five years have had a much greater number of special education students matriculating into our system. And yet the rate of special education teachers to meet that need falls far short. We also have a significant number, the blue column, of temporary employees who are hourly earners without benefits with a very high attrition rate, whether it's voluntary um, or involuntary, breaking consistency for the kids. And our parents students also outnumber our teachers. So if each, we'll start with Ms. Mallow, if you can please address this glaring um, finding, and, and this is not, this is actually sadly unique to Howard County. This is not, um, you know, routine in our area or certainly in education. Ms. Mallow. Um, so do you want me to speak to the first slide or the second slide or them in total? I mean, one is married to the other, as you please. Okay. So um, one of the things that I, I, I do see that we have under, historically understaffed special education, particularly in classroom teachers. Um, and one of the things that I'm most proud of is that in the two years I've been on the board, we've actually been able to increase the rate of special education funding at two times that of 
the rest of the general fund growing. So we have made real concentrated choices to increase special education funding. We've added 156 school-based positions and nearly 100 birth to five. So we are taking those committed steps to improving the situation and to remediate the number of temporary employees and increase the number of direct instruction and direct classroom staff. And that just doesn't, it doesn't just happen. What it takes is a conscious choice when one is making hard budgetary decisions to prioritize special education and ensure that those when you're making a choice between are we going to fund these new special education positions yes we are are we funding them at a rate that we want no because we don't have unlimited finances but we have made significant gains in these two years that i've been on the board that is dramatically higher than the um, situation from 2016 to 2018 prior to my time on the board um, special education was growing at a rate equal to the amount of the general education budget and we're not looking for equality we're looking for equity and we've taken the right steps towards trying to achieve that and it's been done through conscious hard choices couple of things there. So um, you voted to reduce only the special, as an incumbent, you voted to reduce only the special education portion of the super proposed budget. Even after educators came with heartfelt pleas in front of the board and to the public to speak of the consequences of the understaffing, the superintendent stated the reduction would be debilitating. And yet the board sent a budget request to the county that was, that was double the increase they had for the entire county with special education cut. Can you please explain in the name of equity, the rationale for that decision? Sure, I'd be happy to. So one of the things that I think we need to look at is the totality of the budget cycle when we put forward, the superintendent puts forward his budget, it is unlikely that that is going to be met. I actually proposed to my colleagues that we take a different approach. And that was originally adopted and then they um, changed their position. And we were stuck, we were then in a position where we needed to have what was considered a realistic budget. And I'm not one for grandstanding. It was unrealistic to even believe that we were going to get the amount that we asked for. So what instead we did is we tried to put forward something that was reasonable and potentially attainable, but knowing that it's going to come back to us and we're going to then prioritize special education when we ultimately passed the budget and in fact we did that so so thank you dr hota so in that spirit of having to make reasonable and attainable decisions for the most vulnerable children to receive faith if you were to be elected to the board what would be one of the first steps you take to correct um, prior actions? I think one thing is we need to be better advocates. Um, we need to be better advocates for getting that funding, um, for convincing um, the county council and county executive that that funding is as important or more important than the other, it's just, you know, than the fund, all the funding we were asking for. Like, you know, it is an area that needs funding. Um, and um, I don't feel like that message is often stated. Um, one of the testimonies I gave during the budget had to do with class sizes and how increasing class sizes actually in the long run may cost us more money. And the reason I feel that way is because 
when class sizes increase, it becomes harder to identify students who are falling behind. Um, it's harder to intervene in the most cost-effective manner. Um, and I think one of the really important things we need to do is intervene earlier. Um, so with some students, you know, we know from the get-go that they need interventions early on, but many students we have to identify that they need the interventions. And it can take, I know in, you know, it can take years, right? Like I think, you know, typically families wait a year before they can even get the, the paperwork you need to for your 504 IEP meeting, at least that's my experience. Um, and that whole time your child is falling behind. And as your child's falling behind, you're actually like setting up for more expensive interventions. Um, and so, you know, this won't address everything, but I think we need to incentivize the identification of interventions earlier and to get kids the help they need earlier and to really acknowledge that these children need this help and it's the best path forward and it's the most cost effective path forward. Thank you. Ms. Palmer, your website states education, it, that special education quote, additional positions are certainly needed. However, transparency, accountability, and policy changes are also in order. What would you do as a board member to address any of these three? Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, uh, so I'd like to try to address all of those and I'm going to try to do it quickly. Um, first of all, in terms of additional positions being needed, you know, the conversation that we were just having with your last question, I think this is an example where leadership is critical and where we are missing it today on the board. So we should not be submitting uh, budgets that we know are unrealistic. We should not spend time putting together a number that we know is not going to be met only to turn around and then rush to make cuts in order to accomplish the, you know, uh, in order to meet the number that we finally get. What we need is to clearly articulate our priorities and to identify the resources that are needed to support each of those priorities so that decision makers understand very clearly if they don't provide the requested funding, what is going to be cut. And I think that is how we promote transparency and that's how we promote accountability. Because right now when we don't get the full budget that's asked for, the decision makers can say, oh, you know, I didn't know that that is the thing that the board was going to cut. If we prioritize where we wanted that money to go and they could see clearly what was going to be cut if they didn't provide the full budget that was requested, I think that goes a long way toward increasing transparency and accountability. Um, the policy issues that I was referring to uh, have to do with this waiting to fail model, um, at the time not doing sufficient testing. We also have issues with following the policies that we have, and I've highlighted bullying as one of those examples as well. So I think we have a number of policies uh, in HCPSS that we don't follow. Um, I think we need to address you know, enforcing and following the policies that we have and then revisiting some of our policies in terms of when we provide services to our students uh, with special needs. I hope I touched on all of the pieces. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mello, so I'm gonna shift a little bit now to talk about equity um, and, and really, you know, I have a good springboard with policy here. So students with disabilities on IEPs and 504s have been excluded in many recent equity policy drafts, reports, and discussions. What do you see as the board's role in ensuring equity for the special education population? You're muted. You're muted. Since policy is one of the foremost things that the board does, um, I love this question. So. Prior to my time on the board, I sat on multiple policy review committees. I was chair of the Community Advisory Council. I testified to the board over 50 times on policy itself. So this is really near and dear to my heart. And in particular, the equity policy that we just passed, it has special education in it. And it was part of that dealing, uh, working with my colleagues to make sure that it was embedded in there and 
and it was and making sure that we have quantifiable metrics. So when we're talking about the policy and for example, disparate discipline, we know that it's not just males and it's not just black males, but it's special education students and it's this nationally and it's this in the, um, within HCPSS. So really looking for those accountability measures and making sure that special ed is integrated and included in it throughout the policy. And I think that while it may not have been in some of the earlier drafts, what we ultimately passed in this first ever policy was its inclusion. And um, we can also look towards the policy review cycle and know that this will be coming up again within three years and we can take lessons learned and improve if we find the need for it. So I'm really excited about its inclusion within the policy. Dr. Hotop, same question for you. Um, just to make sure I have it correctly, um, we're talking about the, the policies and how the policies like equity need to include special education students, correct? Need, need to include a, special education students both you know with importance from both the board and educators there there, there should be no um discrepancy in who wants what in a policy yes um, so I, I can say you know yes i think special education was added there was discussion there was testimony on that but i feel like often the, it's not in the conversations that are had about equity um and it should be. Um, some of the disproportionality that we see is definitely with special education students. And for some reason, it almost feels like um, that's treated as acceptable. And it's, it's not acceptable. It's, it's not acceptable for parents. It's not acceptable um, for the students. Um, so yes, we need to do more. It needs to be at the forefront. Um, you know, when we talk about equity, we need to talk about equity for everyone. Um, and I, I think, you know, that that has not been happening. That's not part of the conversation. I think some of the conversations have been more narrowly focused. And those areas like minorities um, are very important, but we can't leave the rest behind. Um, and one of the places I have the greatest concern with respect to special education has to do with income disparities. Because in my own experiences, like, we can afford to pay for tutors, we can pay for the testing. I know many families who can't, can't afford to pay for the testing to get their students the, the, the 504 plans or the IEPs that they need. Um, and I really think we need to do a better job in that area to ensure that we also have this kind of integration of all the equity um, components. Um, and I don't think we've done a, a good enough job with that to ensure that everyone is getting the access they need to um, special services. Thank you. Thank you. So when we talk about equity and when we talk about inclusion, there has to be a way with which we track it. So I'm going to switch to accountability right now. And this is a question for Ms. Palmer. The compliance metrics used by the Department of Special Education reads like a guide for a good IEP. But many parents believe IEPs are not being followed. How would you change the way the school system measures compliance? And I want to point out that compliance does not translate into implementation with fidelity. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've heard many, many stories here, and I think this gets um, to a broader issue that I believe we have across the public school system, and that's the culture. And accountability, I think, is something that is ingrained in a culture. And so it seems that the culture within the school system um, is to first, uh, you know, not not offer the services and then when parents fight and argue and do finally get an IEP for their child um, it becomes kind of a, a bare minimum check the box 
And many families that I've spoken with have had to go hire a lawyer, an advocate um, to, to advocate on their behalf for their child to get the services that they need. Uh, I see that as a fundamental issue in the culture across the school system, and it starts at the top. Um, the leadership has to be very clear about their expectations, about how we're going to hold administration accountable um, across all of our schools, and that needs to flow down. So I think, you know, the, the teachers I always assume are doing the very best they can. So I think we need to get to a point where for any of those cases where there is non-compliance, um, we need to, to uh, capture and, and identify what the source of the issue was. Where did it break down? Um, and I think we need to gather that data and analyze that data and then figure out what we're going to do differently. Um, it's, it's a tough problem. I mean, changing a culture definitely doesn't happen overnight. And changing a culture where there is a lack of accountability at senior levels is a really big problem. So again, that's why I think um, the situation that we have at the moment where there is a complete lack of accountability uh, when it comes to the interaction between the board and the leadership of HCPSS needs to change drastically. Um, so that, that would be uh, my approach. Thank you. So next question is to Ms. Mallow. In that spirit, we have some schools that do very well with providing special education to students. And we have other schools where there seems to almost be a gradient of quality of services provided. We've struggled for a long time to find a way to ensure that all 74 of our schoolhouses that deliver special education do so using the same evidence-based um, interventions and to the same quality. Can you speak to this gradient that exists in our district? Um, well, so actually I wanna tie it back into the last question because I think one of the ways that we can address the gradient and address the problem is by innovating and innovating right now when we have the opportunity to. So what I'm thinking of is, let's call it an IEP dashboard that can look at it for a family's purpose at an individual level. So when my middle child was 18 months old, she started receiving special education services. And within her IEP, there was numbers of hours provided, as well as goals, what they hope to accomplish over the ensuing year. So let's build that into a dashboard where a parent can say, I see the, the goal, the hours of service are being met, as well as I see that the goals are being achieved. And then from there, you take that step up and you can look at it at a teacher level, you can look at it at a school level, and you can look at it as a system level. So if we have this multivariate dashboard, then we can address the gradient and try to then implement those routine um, evidence-based interventions similarly across the schools, um, particularly where we know that it's working. So if a family finds that a particular system or intervention is working, then we take those lessons learned back to the schoolhouse and then apply it to other children who it might work for. So it's kind of a combination of a dashboard and a lessons learned where we have kind of a collegial sharing of ideas and methodologies in order to build a better system. Thank you. So. <clears throat> I just, I, I want to ask you one follow-up to that. So I'm sure. putting the last three kind of concepts together. And that is, we know right now we do have a gradient. We also know that we have um, issue with staffing and we have issue with attrition. And we have our children spending a lot of time with often the, mo the least qualified um, educator. So we have just, before the pandemic, we all lived through the redistricting process. Do you think that redistricting, if we were still in the schoolhouse today, would have 
and students with disabilities significantly being removed from the school that they know and knows them and being subject to this gradient that exists in our districts. So, of course, a gradient affects our students. Um, but one of the things that I'm not entirely clear on is when we talk about it and apply it to redistricting, we do know that students who had 504s and IEPs were allowed to choose to stay at their school. So one would assume that in general, because parents are advocating for their children, we would want their, the parent would know whether or not this education being provided is working for their children. So it then when we offer that, to those children who have the IEPs and the 504s, it's incumbent on the parent to say, yes, this is working for us, we want to stay, or no, we're going to take advantage of moving to a new school and new opportunities. So um, I believe that that doesn't really speak to the staffing and attrition, um, but I would need a little bit more information to ask how you were asking about those two issues. Uh, just in the interest of time, I want to pose the same question to both Dr. Hotop and Ms. Palmer. And I'm, I'm muting myself because my students down here now bouncing around. So that's why I'm putting my um, mic on mute. I think you want me to go first, but I'll just go first. Um, so, um, uh, you know, students were, or families were given the opportunity for students with 504 and IEPs to stay at their uh, original school. Um, and I just have to say hello to your student. Um, but anyway, um, and, but I think, you know, that's a really difficult decision for some families and for some moves. Um, I know families where they knew they were going to be losing their special education teacher um, because they just they were moving to general education because it was just too much and they couldn't do it anymore. So they weren't actually going to get that continuity at their old school anyway, with respect to their teacher. Um, so then, you know, you, do you keep the continuity of the school? Um, and meanwhile, you have other children, right? Like, I, I think sometimes like, okay, yeah, that policy sounds fine until you're an actually a family trying to balance having kids in two different schools whose back to school nights might be the same nights, like PTA meetings might be the same nights. All of a sudden you're giving PTA donations to two schools. Um, and there wasn't the exemption made for whole families. And I, I kind of understand that, but yet it does place this huge burden on families and and families that i'm going to just say like are already doing more than the average family like i think kids families who are supporting kids in special education um, are often already stepping up to do more and so you know you're putting that burden on those families and i just don't think you know it's it's a really a fair um analysis and um i i just a fair choice to make. Um, and I, I think it also, you know, redistricting alienated teachers in a way that also plays out in this. Um, um, so it just, you know, I think that, you know, while the intentions were there with this policy of allowing students to keep, um, get to, to stay at their homeschool, I just don't think that in, in practice it was actually very um, useful. Thank you. Ms. Palmer? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I agree that in, in practice it wasn't very useful um, and many families weren't even aware of what needed to be done. Um, and I know many families who were in the process of getting an IEP or a 504 um, ultimately were not able to take advantage of that. So, um, you know, in my view, it was a little bit of uh, too little too late. Uh, and, and getting back to the idea of priority, you know, we have a lot of problems. Um, we were talking about some of them earlier, reading proficiency, um, the fact that we're not following IEPs and IEP compliance, and all of these issues that we have across the school system. And we talk about a lack of resources as one reason that we haven't addressed them properly. But then when it comes down to it, 
Look at how much time and money was spent on a redistricting plan that did very, very little to address capacity challenges or the stated goals of increasing diversity. So um, I think it's again a, a case of misplaced priorities. I think that we have uh, managed to, to do something that was very disruptive to all families, but particularly so for families with children um, with special needs and it wasn't necessary. Um, we could have accomplished the goals of addressing capacity as well as taking into consideration some of the diversity issues that we wanted to address with far less disruptive um, approaches. So I think that we need to get our priorities straight. I think we need to identify what they are, allocate our resources accordingly, and get aligned toward improving educational outcomes for every student across HDPSS. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll circle back to Ms. Mallow. S over the years, CCAC has asked to limit the number of students with disabilities education classes. And that is because there are some classes that may have 10 or 15 students with an IEP and perhaps another 10 without an IEP. And there are classes where there are maybe one or two students with an IEP and the remainder are general education students. Either scenario is unfair to both sets of students. As a sitting board member, why was that point that was raised by CCAC not um, acted upon or supported by the board? Um, could you tell me when, can you give me a little bit more reference data? Cause I'm not um, understanding. Actually, could you repeat the question and then if sure, need of be. Course. So I'll be more specific. So in 2017 and in 2018, the CCAC report to the Board of Education specifically spoke about the number, certain classrooms have a very high number of children with IEPs and other classrooms do not. So the suggestion was made that perhaps we should cap the number of students with IEPs in each classroom to ensure to everyone that is in that room, whether it be direct instruction or with, with pull-out services. So some schools in our district actually do that, others do not. The Board of Education has the power to, to, um, to, to implement policy, right? Policy we were speaking about and it's near and dear to your heart. So how, how do we work with that? How do we make it right for all of our kids from policy that is rooted in providing education? Okay, um, so it's a great question. Let's start at 2017, 2018. And it costs I, nothing, by the way. I'm sorry? Nothing. It costs nothing. Absolutely. Um, so 2017, 2018, I don't know why the board made choices then that they did. I wasn't on the board and I can't speak for the choices they made. Um, it certainly makes sense to me that a good administrator will know the strengths of their teaching staff, the strengths of their special education staff, and, um, and some of their weaknesses, and would then put that into consideration when they are making class lists for the following year. I do think that there are probably some teachers who are better suited to handling uh, multiple IEPs than others. Um, that being said, I, I think it's certainly reasonable to ask the special education department to consider this and to come back with the recommendations of, is this feasible? Why or why not? What are the implications if we were to direct the superintendent to develop this kind of mechanism and what kind of benefits do we think we can expect from it and what are the downfalls and when we're looking at the global role of the board of education it's really critical that um, we direct the superintendent as hit you know we only have one employee and it is the superintendent so I, you know, I certainly can't speak to what previous boards have done and why they didn't fund special education as at a level that it needed to be funded. 
why Dr. Foose, who did this zero-based budgeting, wasn't able to really understand the need of the special education community, but I think that we're beginning to address it now and to really take those critical steps and to continue on this path. So I would think it would be a partnership with the school uh, central administration as well as school-based administration to best utilize our staff for the benefit of our students, uh, particularly our most vulnerable students. Thank you. We can go on for hours talking about special education, but I want to respect everyone's time, your time and the viewing audience's time. Um, so we are coming to the end. Um, I'd like for each of you to take two minutes to make your closing statements to our community. And we will go ahead and start with Dr. Hota. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd just like to thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to participate today. Um, some people may not know that I'm on the ballot uh, because I'm not written on the ballot. I'm actually a write-in candidate. Um, I declared as a write-in candidate back in March or early April. Um, and um, so if you like what you have, what, if you like what I have to say and what you, like, what you hear from me, um, you have to write me in. Um, and my last name is Hotop, H-O-T-O-P-P. -P. Um, a little bit more about me. I am a professor and scientist in microbiology and in genomics. Um, I have dedicated my life to education. It's my profession. Um, with respect to special education, I have both um, supported students uh, with accommodations in the classroom, um, as well as been a parent um, of a child who, of two children, one who had an IFSP and another with a 504 plan. Uh, I live in Columbia with, uh, in downtown Columbia with my husband and my two sons who attend Bryant Woods Elementary School and Wild Lake Middle School. Um, and you know, I can, I can talk more about special education, but overall, I think, you know, what I really want people to know is that I promise to be engaged and communicate with all residents. Um, I am a critical thinker. That is how I have uh, been trained. So not just data driven, but really thinking about the data that's presented to me and what the nuances are and the questions that I should ask. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an educator, um, and so education is very important to me. And I'm also a microbiologist, and I personally think that expertise is really needed right now um, on the Board of Education uh, in the era of COVID. And so I would like to provide um, my expertise uh, to the residents of Howard County um, by serving as a Board of Education member. Thank you. Um, Ms. Palmer, two minutes. Thank you so much. Um, so I am running for the board because I see a school system in crisis. If I saw HCPSS um, doing well, moving you know, on, a, on a good path forward, I would not be running for the board. Um, the reason I'm running is because I see educational outcomes suffering. I have two children currently in HCPSS. I'm a graduate of the Howard County School System and a lifelong resident. And I'm very dedicated and committed to ensuring that our school system and our county continues to be top notch uh, all the way around. And um, I'm unhappy with the direction that the school system is heading. I think we need to get focused on identifying the most urgent and important topics that we need to focus on. Um, right now, that's getting children back into school safely as soon as possible, providing teachers with the tools they need to educate our children, um, ensuring that parents' voices are heard and listened to, um, and aligning our resources to a strategy that actually closes achievement gaps. I keep hearing uh, those words, but I don't see the corresponding actions required to actually close those gaps and provide an excellent education for every student in HCPSS. Um, I think we need leaders with experience in how to effectively manage organizations and billion dollar budgets. And I'm the only candidate in District 4 with that experience. I've been an executive in a very large R&D organization um, for seven years. I know how to handle uh, hundreds of staff, not just the one that we would have, um, and millions uh, of dollars in funding each year. And I understand how to prioritize uh, a strategy 
and prioritize resources accordingly, to measure how you're doing against those priorities, and to hold people accountable for ensuring those, uh, those goals are met. So I think we need change. The time for change is now, uh, and I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, final word goes to our incumbent, Ms. Mallow. Thank you so much. Thank you, CCAC, and for the Howard County Autism Society for sponsoring this forum. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So um, first, I want to correct the record. Um, I also have experience passing a billion dollar budget. And I've got 10 years of experience working on and analyzing and researching and testifying on the HCPSS budget. So I certainly have that experience. I'm a mom of three graduates of Howard County Schools. One of my children is twice exceptional. I have a commitment to hard work. I bring my expertise in literacy and some of the large scale literacy and phonemic awareness projects that I've worked on within the Howard County Public School System, setting up reading closets, everything from PTA president to chair of the Community Advisory Council. Um, we have 132 teachers being trained in Orton Gillingham this year to address dyslexia, partly because of my advocacy. We have BCBAs being added to our birth to pre-K program significantly because of approval of the budgets I've supported. I've got experience working as a preschool administrator and a preschool president. So I, scan, I range from preschool all the way to university administration. So my experience has been concentrated in Howard County Public School System. And I have an in-depth knowledge and expertise and a background that I bring to the system. And it takes a lot to hit the ground day one running and being able to do the job. And I'm the only candidate with the capability, with the background and the experience in order to do that. And with that, I ask for your support in this election. I'm Jen Mallow and I'm running in district four for re-election. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes our hour together. I appreciate your time your energy and your commitment to our families and our students. Um, thank you viewing audience. We had great turnout this evening. As all of you know, this was recorded and it will be posted on both the Howard County Autism Society website, CCAC, and we have to figure out a way to um, stream it if it's not already streaming on Facebook. So once again, thank you very much and everybody please be safe and have a great night.